Hi, welcome to the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, uh, episode number 15. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books on what I call pre-digital pop culture, uh, things about old-time radio, the pulse, pulp magazines that Tarzan Burroughs stuff was usually published in, and other such items. And with me tonight are, Jess, go ahead. Jess Terrell, and you would know me from the Facebook group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs, where with Little of Pop, we talk about ERB um, every day of the week and deep into the night. So please come and join us for the love of all things Edgar Rice Bros. I'm Scott Stewart, uh, jack of all trades, mostly writing and editing. Mm -hmm. And tonight, uh, for our 15th episode, we are going to be talking about the novel Tarzan and the Golden Lion, uh, which was first serialized in Argosy Magazine in, um, let's see, December and January of 1922 and 23. Uh, Burroughs wrote it, I guess, in Feb between February and May of 1922, was published uh, beginning at the end of that year. It was a seven part serial. Um, and the first edition of this book as a hardback was, in, was later in 1923 uh, with a reprint in 24. And uh, since then, it has been reprinted repeatedly, as all of Burroughs' stuff has, uh, in a number of paperbacks, with, uh, often with superb cover illustrations. And right now, as we record this in, uh, in the beginning of December 19, uh, 2020, 2020 um, the authorized hardback edition of this, put it being put out, the part of the series being put out by Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, is on pre-order. So there will soon be um, uh, that edition available with another breathtaking Joe Jusco cover. I could not praise the cover that Joe Jusco is doing for the Burroughs, for the, for the Burroughs hardback authorized editions enough. They are, everyone is literally aghast when you look at it for the first time. Breathtaking. Uh, let me jump in here on, on that, add to, to, uh, add to your breathtaking uh, review there. Um, those uh, Jusco covers mm -hmm. are available as fr and frame as frameable 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 he said prints mm -hmm. from iCanvas.com and ERB Inc just uh, like last week uh, made available some jigsaw puzzles of those same covers. Oh well, now that's neat. I didn't know that. That is awesome. But I'd like to also add too the the covers are stunning. They're just beautiful, but the uh, uh, printing, the publishing of the actual book, too, the uh, typeset and design, it's, it's so comfortable and easy to read mm. and good, sturdy, hardback, uh, uh, sewn uh, binding. They're just they're beautiful books. Mm. I, I think it's pretty obvious that Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated is being run by people who just don't want to make money, which would be perfectly legit by itself, but, really have, but have a real love of Burroughs' work and are treating it with respect. Three. Okay, but uh, this novel, a very fun novel, by the way. I have to say that I first read this one when I read all the Tarzan novels as a young boy. And it was some years before I read it again. And my memory of it was it was just kind of pretty good. Um, uh, uh, but then when I re got around to rewording as an adult, I was impressed by just how much fun it was. Um, so for so, so whatever reason, it didn't quite click with me as a 12-year-old. But when I was a little older, it just, I just could see just how great an adventure story it was. And I had a ball rereading it for this podcast. Um, but we are going to be summarizing it chapter by chapter as we normally do. Um, and Scott, you were going to pick up with the first seven, chap seven chapters, I believe. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be doing chapter... Uh... One through seven here, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pick up on that then. Yep. Um, uh, he opens up this story actually with the animal kingdom before he gets to the human characters. Mm -hmm. And this also helps set up some of the events uh, um, where he creates a family that you're starting to care about and some stuff happens in it and they're animals but he's already didn't care about that. He opens up with a, a lioness uh, he calls Sabor is her name there. And uh, she has one cub 
and she's very protective of that cub because the uh, other two uh, cubs she had have died from uh, from the weather and um, uh, malnourishment because she's not getting enough uh, food to uh, nurse all of them. So she's being very protective of that cub. And uh, then there's a, a ruckus in the noise. She's looking around in the jungle there and goes out. And uh, um, there's a native uh, from the area there who sees her and she wants to protect the cub too. So she leaps to him at the same time, uh, basically that he's throwing the spear which goes through her, but she lands on top of him and kills him at the same time. Now the cub is orphaned. And you really, you really do feel bad. <laughs> and it's not a overly graphic death scene, but there is an emotion in it when the way uh, Burroughs wrote it. Uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, the, the cub is found by Tarzan who's coming back from uh, Peladon with uh, uh, Jane and his son, Korak. And Peladon, you'll find in other books and stuff and the adventures they have in, in, a, in the Lost Land like that. But now they're returning back to the ranch. So he picks up the cub and uh, uh, decides to bring it with him. When they're doing that, they stop at a village along the way and uh, while they're there, they uh, make a trade or, or given a, uh, a dog that is there that can nurse, but who had lost her pups to a uh, snake, anaconda, or a bull constrictor, something came through there. So uh, it's a, a village called Uma, um, Umaga, um, Umaga, Umaga. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'll go uh, Umaga for that. <laughs> and um, the, the name of that dog is Za. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tarzan names the lion Jad, Jad Bajal. Jad Bajal. Um, and if I get the name wrong, you guys are welcome to correct it. But uh, he, uh, uh, that name means golden lion. And that's in the language of... Uh, uh, one of the languages from Peladon, who they just came by. Then they end up getting home, and when they get there, they see that uh, a lot of the ranch has been, or estate, plantation, whatever you want to call it, has been uh, rebuilt by those allies and friends of his and the Waziri tribes members who, who live close to him because it had been destroyed earlier in a raid. Mm -hmm. And that Pretty much is what you got there in, in uh, chapter one. Does yeah. anyone have any comments they want to throw in on that? I, I just want to say how much I agree that Burroughs builds empathy for the little lion club uh, very quickly but very effectively. You do really, you do sincerely feel badly for the cub. So you're rooting for Tarzan when he decides to adopt it, um, yes, which yes. he does, uh, even though Korak, his son, thinks that trying to raise and domesticate a lion, although he never really domesticates them, uh, is probably doomed for failure. They, they actually make a bet about whether or not Tarzan can raise this, to uh, raise the Tarzan, to uh, raise the lion to be obedient and to, you know, not eat all their servants. The, yeah. the banter, the banter between Tarzan and Korak, I think here is, is really neat. And it's, a, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's good family, fun, uh, a competitive mm -hmm. conversation. And I really wish we'd seen more of that in, in these stories. Um, but what we do get here, I think, is, is very, very well handled and just really adds a lot of flavor to the story. It is fun because as, as, as uh, far as the regular books are concerned, we never get more than occasional ca uh, cameo of Korak with, uh, again in the rest of the series, do we, if he's mentioned at all? Uh, that's uh, that's about right. There is yeah. over in Tarzan and the Ant Man, which comes after this book. Mm -hmm. There are some opening comments there as Tarzan's about to take uh, Korok's airplane for a ride, mm -hmm. um, which leads leads into that entire adventure. Uh, so they have a little back and forth there. But 
but again, that uh, Korok something screen time, so to speak, is just a few pages there. Yeah, and we really don't see much of him. I wish we'd seen more. Yeah, we we had to wait for Dell Comics to give him his own series to actually get yeah. <laughs> the the adventures of Korak in any in, in depth way. Um, Korak was also used a lot in the uh, 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 newspaper comic strip set. Russ Manning. That's true. He was. Yeah, yeah. He's a great character, but I guess Burroughs just must have decided that his readers wanted Tarzan, um, and so centered you know, centered his uh, stories on that, on the dad rather than the son. Well, the story I've heard in, the, on, in that regard, and I don't know how true this is, uh, so take it for what it's worth, a big grain of salt, but supposedly Burroughs wanted to do more Korok stories, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the editor said, oh, no, 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 uh, the public wants Tarzan. Give us more Tarzan stories. So okay. that, that may be why Korok's screen time was limited. That's at least the second time a major change was in Tarzan mythology was because of editors. The first one being the, for being forbidden to kill Jane off uh, two yeah. novels before this. <coughs> so, well, then, I'll move on into chapter two here then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the uh, elder tribesmen there is called Old uh, <coughs> Muvero and uh, everybody there um, rejoices that uh, Tarzan and his family's returned and have a, a big and, and happy ceremony that goes on for quite a while, I believe, if I remember, am I correct in remembering several days uh, um, in the book, but uh, they are, are happy about that. And uh, Tarzan and, and Jane and Korak are also amazed at the rebuilding that's uh, been done for the ranch, for their home there. Uh, a key part of this uh, chapter is where uh, Tarzan's raising the cub and training him, uh, uh, sort of like you might train a, a attack dog. And uh, again, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Jess, uh, or I think it was Jess, uh, Korak thinks uh, you're crazy. It was maybe that? Maybe that's you, Tim. Uh, crazy to try and raise and, and tame a uh, lion like that. But Tarzan goes through the different uh, techniques to uh, have him moving slowly and then faster and bigger and what he catches and brings back and returns to him. And then he takes it out uh, into the field for a real, real world test. And Korak again is like, you know, hey, Tarzan or dad. <laughs> You're nuts. You can't do that. You, you, what you've done is created someone who's actually going to kill people and kill us or kill you when he returns. And uh, Tarzan and he bet each other a hundred pounds. So uh, you know, so they're doing to it pretty well when they can bet a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the the estate isn't quite empty yet, but uh, they go out and they hunt for a, a antelope. And he, Tarzan, tells uh, Jad Bujar to uh, go and, and catch, kill, and bring the antelope back to him so that they would have possession of it and uh, divide among themselves if they were going to eat off of it and then give lion a share. And Korak, of course, thinks he's either going to attack them or uh, keep the antelope to himself, but he does bring it back to Tarzan, but when uh, Tarzan reaches for it, the lion snaps at him. But Tarzan was expecting that and throws the lion on its back and holds it down, uh, thereby playing what we, we've seen if you watched uh, uh, episodes, uh, documentaries about wolves and other animals about that alpha male. So Tarzan's taking, showing that he's the leader of, for the line of the pride and that he's the boss. And in that way, uh, Jad Bujar uh, subjugates himself to that. And uh, I guess uh, Korak loses his bet. You know, uh, Tarzan's able to create several commands that um, uh, the line understands and follows. And, now, now he's got 
got a hunting lion instead of a hunting dog as a companion. And Are there that, things to add to that? Uh, uh, I have to say that I, I think it's interesting that he that Tarzan doesn't train Jad Baljo to never attack a man. He just trains them to only attack on command and not to eat the man without orders. It's like Tarzan knows if he's got this lion companion, his life is such that sooner or later, there's going to be somebody he needs the lion to kill. So, so he's just preparing for that in advance. Yeah. Uh, build, building on that, if I may, you know, in some respects, this is a story of a boy and his dog. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the various yeah. adventures they have, they kind of, well, I don't want to say, well, I will say this, they kind of grow up together, or at least they grow together uh, over time through, through their closeness. I don't think Jad Balja is ever let into the house that we know of, and eventually he is confined, confined in a cage after a while, but he gets to be full growing. But, mm -hmm. but he is closely monitored by Tarzan and, 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 and uh, is proper and is trained to the best of Tarzan's ability when dealing with the wild animals' natural inclinations. I wanted to point out that, to our knowledge, Tarzan has two prior uh, experiences in training wild animals. Now, who knows what he was doing between books, mm -hmm. but in the books, there was a beast of Tarzan where he, where he takes a full grown leopard, Sheeta, and, and trains said to be a part of his team that's uh, tr tracking down his kidnapped infant. Um, and, and the time he spends with Sheeta there is, is very well documented by Burroughs. They hunt mm -hmm. together, they work together. The, the cat actually nuzzles up to him and rubs against him. You don't, <laughs> if that happens to you <laughs> in real life, you need to step back. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for Tarzan and this and this leopard, it seems to be a very normal occurrence. They have a, a great deal of affection and respect for each other. Mm -hmm. the, the other instance is in Tarzan Untamed. Now, this again is a full-grown animal, and the approach here is a little different because it's full-grown. Tarzan keeps it cooped, as I recall, it keeps it cooped up in a cave, and the only food this lion gets comes from Tarzan. And Tarzan makes sure the animal is hungry, doesn't mistreat him, but he does make sure the animal is hungry before he before he um uh, feeds him. And then when he does let the uh, lion out of the cave, he's got a leash on it and big mittens on, on, on all four feet to keep him getting scratched. And then Tarzan just, you know, nudges him over to um, where the Germans are, turns him loose in the, uh, in the trenches. And that's the, that the great scene from World War One where the lion is uh, chasing all the, um, the, uh, the enemy there. But those are two instances where Tarzan has trained wild animals previously. I wanted to be sure that we mentioned. Yeah, and I, I don't want to start dwelling on another book, but that action sequence in Tarzan the Untamed, where he's using a lion, a captured sniper rifle, a captured machine gun, and some hand grenades to decimate the Germans, is one of Burroughs' more epic battle uh, action scenes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but yeah, so that takes us to chapter three, right, Scott? Yeah, no, I was just going to add on to what you guys were mentioning, too. Um, this is a more realistic version of Tarzan working with and communicating with an animal compared to what I grew up with, with the uh, Johnny Weissmuller movies where, and first one I saw, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years old, but in there, in the movies I saw in my mind read it almost like Tarzan was practically a Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> the animals were his friend. He could talk and communicate with them. And of course, it's simplified for the movies, but he'd let out his cry and elephants would come rushing to help. And <laughs> you know, and in the books you find out, no, not all the animals are his friends. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's like this factor, which ones are his friends, and which aren't, which he communicates well. Well, of course, in the books here, yeah, Burroughs treats that along with the idea that this is a fantasy, treats it along, uh, the ideas of a, a more realistic pacing the time going by because um, we'll see uh, after uh, we get, I talked about chapter three, we'll have jumped up uh, about two years in time with the lion. So uh, the whole thing of working and training isn't just because he had a, a magical yell on that he was raised by the uh, great apes because uh, he has to work and live with them uh, just as the animals would still have their natural instincts too. Mm -hmm. and chapter three takes us to a different location, pops us up to London, uh, and we uh, leave Tarzan and his clan for a little bit. And at first we're introduced in a, uh, like a pub 
to two people. One is uh, Flora Hawks, who will we find? We will find out um, uh, had been a uh, worker or maid for Tarzan in their uh, one of their London houses or townhouses uh, years before. So that's how she knows some of this information. And she is there at this time with a person named Esteban Miranda, and he's a actor and. Uh, um, a Spanish-born actor, and very much looks like Tarzan, basically a twin of Tarzan, which is why Flora Hawks has, has found him out and uh, will use him. And Esteban um, lusts after Flora. He, he's got the hots for her, and he already has the jealous hots for her. Because <laughs> there'll be four men who join him, and these uh, people are John Peebles and Adolf uh, Bluber, or I might say Blubber, since he's supposed to be a heavy German, but I'll say Adolf <laughs> Bluber, uh, Carl Kraski, and uh, Dick Throck. And uh, um, two of them are English. One is German, and another one is a uh, Carl Kraski. He's a, um, a Russian dancer. He's supposed to be a very good-looking Russian dancer. And uh, they uh, sit and talk about what the plans are, and uh, this is where she starts telling him about wanting to go to Opar. Now, Opar shows up, I believe, in five Tarzan novels, if I remember right, stories. So this would be, I think, the, for the second time? Shows third up? time, I believe. Third, be, third time, okay. Yeah, Return of Tarzan, yeah, Return of Rules of Opar. Yeah. And I think this is the third time. This yeah, is the third time. Third time, yeah. Yeah, Return of Return of Tarzan had two visits in that book, but but this is the third book. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they uh, talk about that. Uh, the uh, German man is uh, very tight with his money, but he is putting the money up for the expedition. And Flora's job, uh, of course, she wants to do all this, go to Old Park, because of the wealth that is supposed to be there, and that's what she's talk these guys into um, and uh, making the plans on how they will meet there and um, how they will split up and meet and what their plans will be there to get to Opar, to retrieve uh, uh, the money. And of course, part of the hope is uh, with Esteban Miranda being along that they'll be able to, whether they're in Opar or other places, pass through having people believe that she's with Tarzan and maybe I have more protection or better access to at that point. Um, uh, comments? I uh, will have to say that Burroughs does something, starts uh, something in this chapter that I think is an important theme through the book is that we already get the sense that these people don't like each other and that in some cases they're going to be willing to double cross each other. And Bluebird is going to cause disaster just by being such a penny pitcher and not getting penny pincher and not getting them the right equipment, uh, even though he's supposed to be funding the expedition. Uh, and I think that parallels Tarzan's adventures, where the allies he gets along the adventures, as well as Jad Balja, are all very loyal to him, and he's very loyal to them. Um, uh, you know, often willing to risk his life or even give his life to uh, to to maintain that loyalty. So you get the hints here of what's going to be more obvious later on. The bad guys ha have largely have the, the fatal flaw of just chronic backstabbing, whereas the good guys, personified mostly by Tarzan and his relationship with his lion, are going to be just loyal to each other unto death. Um, and and I believe that Burroughs did that parallel deliberately. Yeah. If I if I can add to that, something I was kicking around up and just giving me the push to say something about it, uh, leadership, in mm -hmm. my opinion, which leadership's a favorite topic of mine anyhow. Uh, but in my opinion, those bad guys really lack leadership. That and I think that leads to some of the, or encourages some of their backstabbing and uh, and each of them having their own agenda and the lack of trust. Now, later on, they do establish Flora as a leader, but they're, they're already in Africa by that point. In my opinion, they, sh they should have someone who will, who will draw the line 
and issue orders and, and keep them all on target as to their objective, they should establish that up front and they'll save them some time and effort, maybe improve their planning process uh, when, before they get to Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think that's another, I, I think that's a great insight um, that I really hadn't thought about. But yeah, we have um, a parallel in the, the, the advantage of strong leadership too. Um, and then Flora, of course, will have her own separate little care, bit of character growth, which I think makes her uh, a very unique character. Um, so um, I like her. I kept picturing her as Jean Harlow, the actress from the 30s. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That works. Yeah. And, um, and also, again, uh, like so many, you know, you can go into the film noir, um, mm. Maltese Falcon, movies like that, where you have the gang where it's all about greed. No yeah. one trusts the other person. They are there to get as much that they can get away with. Yes. And if they don't have to share it, all the better. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I also think he, he made this a little multinational group, you know, a German, a Russian, a Spaniard, um, and, you know, a couple Englishmen in order to help differentiate them. So they, it just didn't seem like, you know, five identical thugs in a group. It was a way of, of giving them individual personalities, uh, which I think was also very effective. It made each one unique. And, mm -hmm. and, and, also, and I agree about the personality difference. Mm -hmm. And that also goes along. He could have very easily just defaulted and because of the war, had to be a group of Germans or, or yeah. something like that being the enemy. But here he uh, kind of shows that uh, across the board, it doesn't matter what country you come from. You got bad guys in all of them. Yeah. People are people and they'll each have their own agenda. Yeah, yeah they are. That's true. So. so when we return now to chapter four, uh, it's uh, about two years later, because that's how old uh, Jad Bajar is now. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, he stays in a cage now. He's not like harnessed and outside on a tree or allowed to roam free. And uh, Tarzan keeps him in a cage, which is important to a, a point that comes up here fairly soon. And at the same time, both uh, because of the war and the raid, everything that's go gone on, their income has been depleted for Tarzan and his uh, family, the estate. So he uh, also needs to take and go to uh, Opar to replenish their supplies. And um, uh, while they're doing that, they also find out there is a, uh, uh, a band of people moving outside the area of where his estate is, but uh, wondering if he may come across them on his way to Opar. He also takes with him a, a group of uh, Wazeri warriors, 50 of them, I believe, 50 warriors with him, and um, uh, leaves, and he leaves the line behind too. It's just him with the warriors. Both uh, 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 Korak and uh, the lion and Jane stay behind. So it's approximately two weeks trip from that area to uh, get to Opar, but he allows uh, about uh, triple or four times that for the traveling time, the time there and getting back. So he figures he'll be back in about uh, uh, 60 days or, or two months time. And as they're going through and moving through the jungles, he uh, sees a man's footprints and then he sees a blood trail from an animal. Um, and then he uh, finds a, uh, a, a, uh, a deer uh, that when he looks at it, finds out it's not a man-made arrow. It's not one he would fashion in the jungle but it's actually one that would be a commercial arrow you would buy out of a, a store or an armory or someplace like that. So he knows it's not by a native um, for this going on. It's not too long after that where he finds a Mangani that's been killed with the same type of arrows. Mm -hmm. And of course, being Mangani now, he's looking at this more as um, straight out cold-blooded killing or murder as opposed to shooting a deer that you may or may not lose if you were trying to shoot it for, um, kill it for food. So now he, uh, um, uh, 
himself. Um, See, I think he finds the Mangani tribe after that, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, that they also had uh, um, known about about the ape uh, being killed there, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, king of the tribe and the people around there don't don't really want him around right now. And he sees other, uh, there, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say they're skittish, but he, uh, Tarzan does see other footprints and uh, that a group had passed through that area. And it would be in the direction he would be going for to Opar. Uh, so he starts moving that direction uh, where he soon sees signs or light fire of a uh, camp up ahead. And that brings us to the end of chapter four. Yeah, and I, I think we should clarify that the apes didn't want Tarzan around. They were telling him to leave because they said, hey, we saw you kill one of our guys. That's right. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. and what, what they saw, of course, was Miranda uh, pretending to be Tarzan. Um, and Miranda pretty much makes a mess of being Tarzan um, uh, through much of the novel. And... Um, we, we see the hints of what we'll learn later on that he's starting to think of himself as this great jungle god where he yeah. really doesn't know what he's doing at all. Uh, and another thing that's interesting too is you're thinking Mangani and, and Tarzan communicating mm. with him, saying it wasn't me. And you're kind of like, well, they should believe on me. He's Tarzan, he's not going to lie about that. But also, there is a form of limited intelligence and in how you can process or think something. So mm -hmm. if they saw uh, Esteban there mm -hmm. and it looked exactly like Tarzan, what they saw is what's in, in their memory to them. They saw Tarzan yeah. uh, kill the ape. Yeah, a, a human being might have accepted, oh, maybe it was somebody who looked like him or yeah. some other theory. The apes are just going to go with what, they, what they're convinced they saw. Yep. Um, this is... Not not to cast dispersions, but I, I just had the thought, mm -hmm. and maybe it doesn't apply here. If perhaps none of those Mangani really knew Tarzan, they knew of him, but did not know him personally, mm -hmm. and their memories are sharp. Anyhow, they get easily distracted. Mm -hmm. But my point was, I wondered if Esteban had a different scent than Tarzan had. If if they if it could be that granular, mm -hmm. that specific. Yeah, the wind might have been run wrong for them to smell him though. That, uh, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, or the distance they may have been. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but um, yeah, because if the scent had been wrong, that, no matter what they saw as an animal, that would have given them doubts. So you just assume that he was upwind or whatever, or downwind, okay. whichever it would have been. Um, it wasn't blowing the right way. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I think we should mention is this is the second time, the first time being Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar, that Tarzan has gone broke financially and gone off to raid Opar for more gold to, to maintain a fortune. Um, I, I think his concern was always making sure that Jane could live the life that he, he thought she should have of comfort. Yeah. Um, I don't think he would have worried about it one way or the other if it had just been him. Um, but, uh, but it was the, in uh, Jewels of Opar, I believe it was mentioned that somebody did some bad investments on for them back in England. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. To be somebody else was running their corporation, yeah. and mm -hmm. that's right. The, yeah. Made bad investments. Yeah. Here it was because it, he, had it, thrown, he had thrown all his money into the war effort. So, yeah. yeah. It's hard, though. It's hard to find a good accountant in the jungle. It is, isn't it? Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but at least this time it wasn't as a, if this, if, presuming he had found an honest accountant, the guy's probably tearing his hair out back home because he's, he's trying to invest the money wisely and Tarzan kept saying, now nah, let's buy some more rifles for the British Army. Or no well, uh, why am I getting all these bills for line feed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, on, on a personal level, I'm sure, you know, Tarzan really cares less about money but if you want to call it in the uh, refining years of civilization in London, he realized the importance 
of the money and could see yeah. what the estate and what he could do with the estate. And as you yeah. said, take care of Jane, uh, mm -hmm. uh, take care of uh, Korak, though Korak ran away and, and you know, lived in the jungle and he, he could do without uh, the money too, but that's yeah. all. But every once in a while my mind goes and said, well, isn't Starzan really stealing? <laughs> well, I think the justification was that the Oparians don't know that gold is there anymore and wouldn't be able to spend it anywhere if they did. Yeah, and they're not using I, it for anything. I think you can, to, to be honest, as, uh, to, I think you can argue that that's kind of a uh, trying to justify it, but yeah, um, um, there you go. Kind of, a, kind of a finder's keepers. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you though, for all the, for all the, the, the pain that the mm -hmm. law has been. Yeah. That Tarzan has had in dealing with her, uh, uh, visiting the um, gold vault <laughs> might might be it might make it all even. Yeah, you can you can say that. Or payment for all the people they've sacrificed to their sun god. Right. Um, yes. So Re reparations. Uh, yeah, reparations. That's great. Let's go with that. So, <laughs> um, I've never really thought less of Tarzan because of it. I've just always wondered, um, you know, if I were in that position and were thinking of what the morality was, would I make the same decision as Tarzan? Yeah. Um, but well, imagine the mess you'd have if you go to the Oparians and say something. Look, look, everybody, or I mean, tell everyone there: La, Kaj, all yeah. the priestly priests. The, uh, mm. the uh, maidens in waiting, everyone there. Look, you all are sitting on a gold mine here, and you could be rich if you took this civilization. Imagine the management problem he'd have <laughs> organizing that group. That's true. Um, yeah, well, the tribal men, he couldn't really get them to understand much. I mean, you, we, we'll see that they can be greedy and want power, but uh, physical monetary possessions like that really aren't that important to open up to. Now, now I'm now I'm picturing like a a a community of Oparian men who are like closer to apes than men, living <laughs> uh, living it up in a Manhattan townhouse, you know, wearing top hats <laughs> and such like that. So uh, I always uh, figured that that law had whispered in his ear at one time, "Take all the gold you want. It's okay yeah. with me." <laughs> I wonder if Oparian gold is taxable income. <laughs> I think it might depend on what state you're in. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's hard to find a good accountant in the jungle. It is. It really is. Um, it, it would be interesting just to see an epilogue describing how Tarzan goes about converting that gold into um, English pounds and getting it properly invested in all of that. So, oh, yeah. So, okay, uh, we're about to jump into chapter five. If there was a glitch or a jump in the uh, podcast you were just listening to just now, it's because we had technical difficulties. Um, I am hosting the meeting that we're recording and I lost internet for a moment. Um, but we are back now and uh, Scott, you are gonna uh, pick up with chapter five. Yeah, I'll pick up with uh, five and repeat the first uh, uh, minute or so we had before we lost. But I also wanted to add um, and this is something uh, I sure looked up before, but I happen to have the Burl Cyclopedia here and, and the uh, Tarzan novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs, which uh, I recommend both of them if you can get them into your ERB collection. They're excellent things. And I looked up Opar here. And uh, just to give a little quick background, because then we were talking about the gold and who owns it or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it goes back and mentions the fact that it is it's the lost city of Atlantis and goes back 10 or 12,000 years to when Atlantis uh, was a thriving, rich, super kingdom. Um, high su a good suggestion for this, if you haven't, Philip uh, Jose Palmer wrote several books about Opar uh, re, uh, that really kind of fill in part of this chronology. Really fun, interesting, good reads in the vein of uh, uh, Burroughs and Tarzan. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, uh, it was discovered by the Wazeri and Chief Wazeri who discovered the gold 
and uh, treasure there. And that's where they're getting it. So basically for eight, 10, 12,000 years, no one knows about this area. So, so the people who currently live at Opar, they don't know about it. And he showed Tarzan about it where he could go there to get uh, ornaments or jewels or anything uh, along those lines. So that can solve a little bit of the, <laughs> how do you find out about it and what kind of permission he had? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, um, anyway, back to chapter five, I had mentioned that um, Jane leaves the area and Korak accompanies her part way because she goes back to London because her father is a, a very, very sick, very ill. And uh, she now is out of the book's picture at this point because of being uh, with her dad and going to London. Korak comes back to the ranch. And uh, meantime, uh, one of the men cleaning up in the area accidentally left the cage for the lion open. So our now two-year-old lion, which is going to be pretty good size, has stepped out. And, and he's actually going to try to follow the track uh, um, that Tarzan took to catch up with him, like a uh, your good companion, your good hunting dog would do. Uh, and while Tarzan, as we mentioned in the last chapter, thinks he sees the light of a camp up ahead. And he goes in there, and it is a camp, and it's the camp of our... Uh, crew, our friendly crew from London. And uh, when he comes in, the only one who isn't there is Esteban. So they think this is Esteban, We're just really playing Tarzan up to the hilt. And he doesn't quite understand who's saying what. And he doesn't know that Flora is in a tent next to him and recognizes him as being the real Tarzan. Uh, so she uh, tells one of the men, you know what, here's, here's something, put this in his coffee to take him out of the picture, which he, they do. And at that point, uh, he uh, is out and um, we jump towards the uh, walls of Opar in the next uh, chapter. Has anyone got well, I have to say we, we we now know why Tarzan wanted gold because Burroughs stresses that he really does like coffee, the one thing from civilization. <laughs> so, so he can't be without gold because he's not going to find coffee beans in an African jungle. Oh, well, the Starbucks is really high there for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if it were nowadays, he might have a Starbucks installed in his estate then. Yeah. <laughs> so we get into chapter six now. Um, the uh, um, uh, Esteban with the uh, natives he's rounded up to work for him have arrived at uh, uh, the outer area where the treasure is hidden in Opar and start excavating or going down and picking that up to take it out of there. A guard on the walls of Opar notices uh, the men originally coming over and, and see it and um, they, uh, uh, Kaj, who's the high priest, who's like the betrothed of, of uh, law, uh, recognize Esteban as being Tarzan. And so they want to uh, take him out of picture and kill him. They think it's uh, Tarzan doing it, not because they know he's stealing gold so much as the jealousy factor. He knows law still uh, has feelings for Tarzan and as high priest, he and basically her husband, um, I guess you could say is jealous about that, or maybe it's part of the power trip he's on. So they go to uh, head to that area to follow them. In the meantime, there's a monkey and the monkey's name is Manu, uh, is watching what's going on and gets up close uh, uh, it's like Tarzan thinking it's Tarzan too. Again, I guess he doesn't get the scent of him, but <laughs> maybe, and maybe he doesn't know Tarzan's scent too. So um, if he's never met him, but he recognizes him somehow and goes up and watches and listens to what's going on there. 
And then uh, when the men have departed and the, the uh, uh, Oparian guards and, and Kaj go off after them, Manu goes back to law to tell her what he has seen and that uh, her husband and the warriors he's leading have left um, to hunt down Tarzan and to kill him. And so she takes off to follow him because she doesn't want that to happen. But I'm trying to think, did she talk to, I, I mean, I know, uh, well, the Oparians. Uh, I know the Oparians are of a kind of a mixed race, but uh, did she talk to animals or monkeys? Yeah, and, they, they, they all speak Mangani. Yeah, that's their language. Is the Mangani language, which oh, all that's primates okay. understand. Yeah, okay. I was going to mention that. So, Somebody so every <laughs> so everybody here, except ironically, the uh, Tarzan, uh, the fake Tarzan, and his natives all have a shared tongue, and that they all speak Mangani. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've, I forgot about that part. Yeah. Now, but, uh, uh, I, yeah. Go ahead. I did, I did want to mention that a lot of this chapter is told from the point of view of Manu the monkey. And I think it's a really clever bit of storytelling. It gives an interesting perspective to the entire chapter. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just just really cool decision, a cool narrative decision on Burroughs' part to do that. And, and oh, go and ahead, Jess. Excuse me, I was going to say, it makes me wonder if Burroughs uh, was inspired by this technique to invent the character of Nakima, who I think first appears in Tarzan the Invincible, if memory serves. Um, let's see, he was in Tarzan and the Lost Empire. Was that first? Or maybe it was Lost Empire. Yeah. It might have been Lost but it came after this book. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Lost Empire, where mm -hmm. Nakima first appeared. Yeah. Uh, this might have been the, the seed that became Nakima. And in the movies became Cheetah for reasons I've never understood. Um, so it's, that's very possible because it certainly has a similar personality to Nakima. So, yeah. Uh, and he might have seen the advantage of having um, having a monkey who could, uh, in Lost Empire, he takes a message to the Wazari, carries a note, who show up at the, you know, in the nick of time at the end to save everything. So um, he, he must have realized that Nakima could be a source of comic relief sometimes, but also an effective plot device to allow Tarzan to get stuff done. It's like telling Lassie, go get, go get okay, help, help, Grandpa, yes, fell down boys, the well. The little boy's fell <laughs> down the well again. Timmy's um, hurt, Timmy's hurt. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so to just clarify at the end, we have uh, Miranda, pretend, Esteban pretending to be Tarzan, pretty much forcing some natives to uh, to steal some of the gold or take some of the gold. And we have Kaj with 100 Oparians following him to kill to kill them. And then La following them because she's still in love. She still has a thing for Tarzan and wants to save him. Also, when you mentioned about the point of view, how Burroughs wrote this, it was very effective because I find I found myself concerned for Manu, for the monkey, yeah. I, I, I was like, okay, don't don't get caught, don't let them see you. <laughs> Sitting there talking to a book to this monkey in a book. <laughs> yeah, I, so the yeah. poor guy's so confused so much. He actually goes up to Esteban to try and warn him, and of course, all Esteban thinks is, is this monkey is chattering at him. He doesn't understand yeah. that it's a language. So, um, so it was it was really a fun narrative decision, and and it's well executed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which will then bring us into chapter seven. Um, and in this part, uh, now Esteban has gone off into a different direction with his uh, group with the uh, stolen uh, jewelry or jewels, gems, gold they've got. And Kaj, the high priest, now with the hundred men he has, uh, find Tarzan, the real Tarzan, not Esteban, um, uh, laying on, on the ground and he's not dead, He's he's been drugged. So what they put in a coffee wasn't a poison that killed him, it was uh, to drug him and put him to sleep. And that camp area is gone. They, they've they all, once he was out of the picture, it sounds like they, uh, they took off. And uh, 
So to get Tarzan out of the picture and also really to build up his power with those who are accompanying him, he says Tarzan needs to be uh, sacrificed to the flaming god, uh, to the sun basically. Uh, and one of the other people who's there with him, uh, another uh, acolyte, if you want to call him, or, or higher up member, um, like doctor or whatever, reminds him that only law, the high priestess herself, uh, has a privilege of doing the uh, sacrifice. But he's claiming this as uh, saying, well, she's my mate and I'm the high priest, so I have the right, I have the power, I have the authority to do this. And just about when he's going to get ready to do that, suddenly the sky darkens because of cloud passing over and covering up the sun and um, stops him from killing because now they're all, the other ones are scared because they're saying he's not supposed to do it. And Kaj is uh, <laughs> a little taken aback too. He's believing he can still sacrifice them, but he's not going to do it in the shadows. <laughs> And uh, uh, that's about time then when Law shows up on the scene. And she says, no, uh, you will not kill him. We will uh, take him back with that. We will decide what to do or how we will sacrifice him, you know, properly in the chamber, uh, uh, in the area where they do it there. However, she explains it to him. So all the followers are saying, yeah, and Kaj has no, really no choice, but she's there now to follow because her word is the law. Mm -hmm. So they carry him back and they put him into a, uh, a prison dungeon cell type thing. And uh, when Tarzan wakes up, he just knows he's in, in like this hole, this dark uh, cell. And after that, uh, while he's still in the cell, um, Duth, who's the one who uh, had told Kaj he couldn't do the sacrifice, uh, has heard that Kaj and, and other members are playing a coup and to uh, take over uh, Opar. And he departs and gets an uh, audience with Law to tell her what's going on and that in order to keep control, she needs to take Tarzan and sacrifice him now so all the people rally around her. And, that brings us to end of chapter seven, which brings shows Tarzana's family coming back from Peladon, adopting the leopard, learning what the landscape is from the wreckage after the war, introducing the villain characters, and bring us to this point here. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, uh, what I want to say first is once again we see Burroughs's skill as a storyteller because this is a potentially complex situation. You mm -hmm. have Law who wants to, who has the high priestess and is supposedly in charge, but Kaj and a particular priestess, Oa, are planning a coup against her. And so you need to understand that situation and the motivations behind uh, all these characters. And Burroughs, with his usual skill, does this in a very succinct manner. We understand who everybody is, and we understand what their motivations are, and we understand that Law is in a position where she has to sacrifice Tarzan to maintain her control of Opar. Uh, it's just very well done and very well explained. And this narrative is actually a subplot because the story that we've been going through is first about them, re Tarzan, returning home and having the, adopting the Golden Lion. Mm -hmm. And we're introduced to the criminals and they come to Africa. And the main thing we're thinking is, oh, how... How is he going to stop the criminals? Mm -hmm. And now we're in a whole different story where he's in the, uh, you know, forbidden or the lost city and dealing with a whole different type of adversity. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially we have two, the story splits off into two separate stories. Um, they're, they're connected in that it was Miranda's, uh, it was Miranda's pretend, uh, impersonation of Tarzan and the others in that party drugging Tarzan that get him captured and get him involved in the Opar story. But it breaks off and, and we now go into like pretty much alternating chapters. 
between what's yep. happening in Opar and then later on in the valleys behind that and what's happening out in the regular jungle with Miranda and his party. Um, and uh, Tars Burroughs often builds up suspense by switching points of view from one chapter to the other and leaving you with a cliffhanger regarding the fate of one chapter, one person until you get past the next chapter. And he does that, he, he uses that technique very effectively in this novel, starting at this point. I'd love to have seen his bulletin board with all the uh, index cards mm -hmm. blocking this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, joke. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, Jess, anything to say on this part of the story before I start to pick up on Jeff, chapter eight? Well, there's certainly a number of plot lines going there, as you, as you mm -hmm. also uh, described so very, very well. And, and to be such a, a backwards, away from civilization place, there's a lot of drama in Opar. Anytime you've got Opar mentioned, <laughs> you've, got, you've got evil priests, you've, you've uh -huh. got the people trying to take law, uh, take law's position, and law has this thing for Tarzan she just won't let go of, and, mm -hmm. and, there, and there's, there's the... Um, the riches and, and the valuable gold and such that we talked about previously. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to cover real quick here that I was going to talk about earlier, and I want to make sure we get this in, I may bring it up again later on, and that is uh, geography. The, 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 we've got three valleys here that we are, that we are, are discussing, or three, three valleys that are involved in this. One, of course, is the Valley of Opar, where, where the, um, the city of Opar sits. Um, but in chapter eight, uh, which we're coming to here shortly, uh, chapter eight entitled Mystery of the Past, there's a reference to great apes that dwell in the valley above Opar. Now that valley above Opar is the valley of the Palace of Diamonds. That's the second valley I wanted to mention. I look at that as back when Atlantis was, was actually running this place and, and before their continent sank or whatever happened to them, uh, I look at that as where the headquarters of the mining operation was, and that would be in the Valley of Palace of Diamonds. So that's where all the executives would work. <laughs> I'm thinking about Fortune 500 company. This is 10,000 years ago, so bear with me. But that, <laughs> that, that, that's where all the executives of the mining operation would, would work and live. There'd be nice restaurants there, shopping, boutiques, that kind of thing. So that's in the Valley of the Palace of Diamonds, which we'll see in this book here shortly. Not to be confused, not to be confused with a third valley, and that is the Valley of Diamonds. Now, that's where the mining operation was. That's where they actually dug out the gold and, and, or, well, and diamonds, uh, and certainly diamonds was this Valley of Diamonds. Uh, but that was where the mining operation was. And that valley is, is mentioned very briefly in Chapter 14 in the Chamber of Horrors, Chapter 14. But that valley really is not discussed here but it does appear in Lion Man. That's where they talk about the Valley of Diamonds. So I made the, mis the mistake of for years, and Christopher Paul Carey and I had a discussion about this via email, and where Chris uh, uh, set me straight, and that is you you've got your Valley of the Palace of Diamonds discussed in this book, Golden Lion, but Valley of Diamonds discussed in Lion Man is a different valley. Mm -hmm. uh, next door, perhaps, but it's a different valley. So that, that's the distinction I wanted to make. And Opar, of course, has its own valley, which we've been to Opar now several times. All right, mm -hmm. that's all I need. Okay, but it is, it is an important to be, to be able to follow the action of the novel, is to appreciate that, that bit of geography. Um, well, if you ever go on to visit, you want to make sure you know which valley you're going to. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Tarzan would just want to know which one that Starbucks is, is located in. <laughs> so, um, so the, uh, um, anyway, shenanigans continue in chapter eight. Uh, the, uh, the, the people plotting against law, uh, you know, come up with an idea to send a messenger to Tarzan to tell him that law is going to help him escape. And then they can kill him when he, when he actually tries to escape and then charge law with treason. But law uh, herself manages to get, lead Tarzan out of the dungeons and into a wooded gorge and they leave, they, they go out of Opar in a direction Tarzan has not been before and come to what we will find out is that second valley, um, which be the Valley of the Palace of Diamonds. Um, and it, um, there is a legend of, of apes who are half men living there. Um, they do see a palace among the trees. And as they travel on, they come to a native village uh, with beehive huts that are suspended from the trees. 
And the natives there are, uh, have ape-like characteristics. They're obviously not quite as evolved as, as actual human beings. Um, so uh, Tarzan, I think, is, considers them even a bit lower on the evolutionary scale than the natives of Paludan that he had met in the previous novel. Um, but they do carry uh, advanced weapons, javelins and battle axes and such. And as La and uh, Tarzan are observing the village, they see a gorilla, a Bulgani in the Mangani tongue, um, with, with the brains of a man arrive. He's wearing gold and diamonds. And as the chapter ends, he begins to speak to the villagers there, to the natives. Um, and so in this chapter, we really have Burroughs beginning his world building, beginning to put together what the society in this village is, which we're going to learn is these natives being subjugated and enslaved by the intelligent gorillas. Um, just a, really a, a rather unusual situation, I would say. Uh, you guys have any comments on this chapter before? That's a good summary. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Um, so the chapter nine picks up right from this. Uh, we will soon, in chapter 10, we'll be returning to Esteban and his group. But for now, uh, Burroughs keeps us in this, uh, the Valley of the Palace of Diamonds, where the Balgani is selecting women and children among the natives to become slaves. So Tarzan kills the guy. Um, and the natives begin explaining that the gorilla is one of the chosen people of Numa, the kind of lion emperor who lives in the Palace of Diamonds. Um, and they come and take slaves uh, pretty much whenever they want um, and take them off to, to do whatever, whatever work they need the slaves to do. Um, and Tarzan tells them that Law is his mate rather than trying to explain the actual situation and tells them to guard Law while he hides the dead Balgani so that they're not blamed by it. So they prepare a hut for La and Tarzan leaves. So Tarzan in this chapter starts to get some information on what's going on here. It's not just the gorillas in charge, but over the gorillas, there's apparently a lion who's considered to be the emperor of the Palace of Diamonds. Um, so even from Tarzan's point of view, and he's, he's runs across some pretty weird civilizations. This one has got to strike him as unusual. Um, Makes me wonder whose idea it was to put a lion in charge. Yeah, they never really explained that. Probably something lost to Bulgani tradition. But you do have to wonder how they originally decided to put to make a lion literary, literally their emperor. Um, it's not like he can make political decisions or anything. He's just kind of there to have them throw slaves to to eat every so often. Nobody's going to argue with him, that's for sure. <laughs> well, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, but um, here is where um, uh, uh, Burrow starts alternating between the two different stories that he has, I believe. Um, he jumps back to the, to the regular jungle, where um, Esteban is leading his hundred natives that he's recruited in the guise of, of Tarzan, of, uh, Tarzan they're, they're getting really weary carrying this gold. Um, Tar, you know, Burroughs is perfectly aware when he's writing this story how much gold weighs. Um, and Esteban is having trouble killing enough game to keep them all fed. So there's grumbling and there's arguments. And uh, uh, you know, this is where their plan starts to fall apart from just being poorly planned out. Um, he's rejoined, by the way, Flora and the others by this time as well. And uh, she, uh, uh, Flora pretty much takes charge um, because none of the others are capable of cooperating enough to make a decision. Uh, she decides they need to, to, uh, to camp out and hunt for enough food to feed everybody before going on. And she tells Awaza, who's the head man of the natives, her plans. And the next morning they go out on a hunt. Uh, Esteban by this time, has just gone completely, he's moved totally into crazy town. He's beginning to think that he actually <laughs> is, he is Tarzan. And he goes off hunting alone and he meets up with the 50 Wazari warriors that had, that had traveled with Tarzan uh, from Tarzan's estate. And they're glad to see him because they think he's Tarzan. They give him up as lost. So it's like, hey, Tarzan, you're alive. 
This is so awesome. And uh, Esteban just goes with this. And he tells the Wazari that there's some white men nearby who have stolen gold from Opar and that the Wazari have to help him raid their camp and take the gold. So first chance he gets, Miranda, you know, Esteban uh, <coughs> shows his own, his own tendency towards chronic backstabbing. Um, he has to communicate in English because he can't speak Wazari. And he explains that, you know, he, he, he uh, uh, knocked his head and gotten some partial amnesia. And he can't remember the Wazari language and he can't remember any of their names. Um, and so, uh, uh, so they just, you know, they want to help whom they think is Tarzan until his memory returns. They, they, uh, they take all the gold from the camp. So when Flora and the other uh, people in her group return, they find they've been wiped out. The, there's no money there anymore. The gold is gone. Um, so uh, uh, Esteban also leaves a message that Tarzan, quote unquote Tarzan, has killed the false Tarzan. Uh, so he's trying to cover his tracks. He's trying to arrange it so that they won't look for Esteban. They'll think he's dead. Um, and so uh, uh, the Kraski, the Russian in the group, immediately comes up with a plan uh, suggested earlier by Awaza, the head man of the natives, to uh, raid some nearby Arab slavers and to take their ivory. They figure they've lost the gold, so they've just switched their goals to stealing ivory from Arab slavers. Um, and once again, there's a lot going on here, a lot of motivations, a lot of shifting situations that Tarzan explains or that Burroughs explains very clearly. Um, it's just one of the most, uh, as I read these books with the intention of analyzing and discussing them, I'm more impressed than ever before at, at Burroughs' skill in building what could be a complicated plot, but explaining to us, mm -hmm. it, to, it, to us so clearly that we never get lost on what's going on. There's really no fluff. There's really no fluff in a Burroughs novel. Now you'll go into extra detail and maybe lush description. There's really no fluff. Every sentence in a Burroughs novel does what it should do. That is, it either reveals character or advances the plot. Yeah. Yes. I agree. If this were a, a modern, you know, George R.R. R. Martin novel, this would probably be page 743 in volume four by the time we got <laughs> Um So. So, whereas we're only a little bit about halfway through the novel and uh, um, things are moving along at a fast pace and we're having fun, we're having fun living this adventure with them and yeah, just no, no problem at all in being able to follow a potentially complicated plot. Um, the chapter 11 takes us back to the Valley of the Palace of Diamonds. So, uh, so, we, so Burroughs continues to leave us with a little bit of a cliffhanger on one chapter and then switch to his other story to, to catch us up on that. Um, now Tarzan hides the body of the dead Balgani that he had killed. Um, and he follows the smell of incense to, the, to explore the walled city of the Balgani, the Palace of Diamonds. Um, he sees an elaborate building that's covered with gold and diamonds. And there's flowers and, and, and landscaping and ornamental trees that are tended by native slaves that are being guarded by the, the, the gorillas. Um, he also sees a procession of Balgani leading a, a lion uh, in golden chains and everyone's bowing down to this old lion. You know, and he actually thinks about, this is topsy-turvy. The food chain should be the men on top, then the gorillas, then the lion. But here, the lion is on top then the gorillas are serving the lion and the men are serving the gorillas. So it's, it's the normal way of things completely flipped around. Um, and uh, um, he uh, he's also theorizes that this was built by the ancient Atlanteans um, to just, you know, guard again, to guard uh, uh, their, the gold mines of Opar and obviously the diamond mines that we'll learn is, is later on is just one valley over as well. And that's a reasonable theory. I've no, I've no doubt that that is, that this palace is of, uh, from the original Atlantis civilization that Op the Oparians are descended from. Um, so he hides the dead gorilla, um, and he investigates the mountains in the back of the valley because at this point his main motivation 
is finding a way out with him in law. Um, he doesn't necessarily want to get involved here. And he finds the mines being worked by slaves, being guarded by the guerrillas. He finds no way out there. And he returns to law in the native village. But he finds the village empty. And an old woman who was left behind, say they, they had, that the, the dead guerrilla had been found and that the uh, guerrillas had come and taken everyone away uh, as slaves. So Tarzan has to go back to the city, climbs over a wall at night, unlocks the gates from within. Um, he climbs up some ivy along one of the towers and he searches for law through many rooms. And just as he opens a door to, on one of the upper, upper floors, he sees a man, a white man standing nearby. Um, and so that is chapter 11, where uh, Burroughs is still building, uh, building this world, building this civilization for us, and uh, throwing Tarzan into a situation where he's going to have to get involved with the palace because Law is now a prisoner there. Any comments from you guys before moving on? I think perhaps one of the things Tarzan was uh, concerned about when he saw this uh, uh, procession with this lion, this royal lion getting all this attention, he was afraid his own lion was going to see this and expect the same kind of treatment. <laughs> <laughs> Jad Baljah will learn he doesn't have to be the, the servant. By golly, he can be the master. So, um, Another thing I noticed um, and that's crossed my mind and here in other books we've talked about and, and that we've read too is uh, when Burroughs looks a lot at the cultures or the societies that are discovered in his books mm -hmm. um, he doesn't he doesn't uh, um, lift up and, and make slavery good mm -hmm. but he does use the slavery showing like the law of the jungle mm -hmm. that the mighty take the weak yeah. make them which has been the history on earth for you know uh 5000 years or whatever mm -hmm. um uh for uh governments um and tribes and whatever for enslaving other humans to make mm -hmm. them do the work they don't want to do and it's just uh, fits in with the whole thing about who, who's the strongest and, and what happens to the weakest in those things. So that's highly believable. It's not one type of color or one type of tribe or mm -hmm. one type of civilization. With the stories, it crosses many different uh, society uh, types and barriers on that. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, and we know that Tarzan always himself condemned slavery. And, um, yeah. you know, he'd battled slavers before this and he would afterwards. Um, so, so, yeah, just presenting slavery as a fact of, of a lot of civilizations um, is, you know, Burrow is, yeah, Burroughs is just presenting humanity the way they've been throughout history. I agree with that completely. But Tarzan taking a stand against slavery whenever given the opportunity like this, I think is very significant. It is yeah. too, yes. And, um, um, also, you know, when we get to chapter 12, we also see that he doesn't present all the black Africans in a just one stereotypical light. The Wazaris, we see, are courageous and have a sense of honor because mm -hmm. they're actually a bit miffed about taking this gold away from the, the other natives and a handful of inexperienced whites. And they, they, they just, it all just has this cowardly feel for, for them. And Esteban's just having trouble playing Tarzan. Um, he runs away in panic from a charging rhino, and the Wazari are just beginning to wonder about him. It doesn't click yet because he looks like Tarzan. It doesn't click that he's a phony, um, but um, th this isn't the Tarzan they know. He's acting with cowardice. He's asking them to do things they don't, they, they don't think match the, the honor of the Wazari, um, and so he eventually tells them to bury the gold. Uh, because he's decided he wants to go back to punish the intruders. And the Wazari like this better. This sounds more like the Tarzan they know. Uh, so they find Flora's camp, um, and he tells the Wazari to go home, and that he's going to just handle all this on his own. Um, so he, he enters the camp. He reveals himself to be Esteban to, uh, 
uh, and he, he claims he was captured by Tarzan and then, then escapes. Um, and he decides to tell Awaza, the headman of the native, about the gold because um, he knows there'd be trouble locating it later unless he has someone who knows the local terrain. So um, was, uh, Esteban and Olaza dig up the gold and they move it a short distance uh, uh, away so that they're the only ones who know where it is. So um, we get, once we start to get the difference between Tarzan, who's risking his life for law, staying loyal to him, and all the backstabbing that goes on amongst the bad guys, especially Esteban here, who just acts with cowardice and treachery in, in everything he does. Um, that's chapter 12. Any guys, anything you guys want to add? Nothing no, I think me. you covered it well there. Okay. Um, so then we, of course, we leave this little cliffhanger again as we jump back to, um, to Tarzan, who remember had just encountered a man inside the, the Palace of Diamonds. And this is a guy who had been captured as a boy when he stowed away on the ship that brought um, Stanley to Africa, the guy, you know, the reporter who went to find Dr. Livingston, um, which doesn't really affect the story, but I think it's a fun little backstory that, that just gives, gives this character a little more personality. It's um, a, a touch of reality. Stanley Livingston were a real thing and a big deal. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, it's just a nice touch. Um, so, and he tells Tarzan that Law will be safe for a few days um, and that there is a mine tunnel that leads out of, the, out of the, this whole system of valleys, but it's guarded. Um, he also learns that there's about 5,000 native slaves and about 1,000 or maybe a little more Bulgani. So the slaves seriously outnumber the guerrillas and they want to escape, but they have no sense of community and they've been captive so long that, they, that it's become kind of a habit with them. And um, the, the, you know, the, the guy tells Tarzan that Law is being held in a, in a specific location. Um, he's, but he's seen by one of the native slaves who reports him to the Bulgani. And they tell this guy to lead Tarzan into a trap. Um, but the guy's not terribly bright. And he comes back to Tarzan and tells him, oh, I've got to lead you into this trap. So Tarzan persuades the guy to lead him to law instead. Um, and he finds her in a throne room with, with Bulgani and with that lion, the lion emperor. Um, so he sends the guy back to tell the other slaves that they can escape with him if only they'll just pull themselves together and try. And then he sees the Bulgani about to feed law to the lion, the lion god. And so he leaps into the room and the, the chapter ends with him throwing his spear, uh, which is, I just think, a great, um, a great uh, uh, a cliffhanger. Um, and it's another great chapter. It gives us more information about what's going on, introduces us to some cool new uh, characters and begins to plant the, 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 the seeds of the slave revolt that will happen uh, within the next few chapters. This was chapter 13, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, that chapter, I just want to point out that chapter is entitled The Strange Flat Tower. Mm -hmm. And Burroughs doesn't really tell us anything, uh, doesn't tell us much more other than it's a strange flat tower. Why mm -hmm. would a tower be flat? Typically they're not. Um, that is expanded upon a little bit in the ancient Opar books that uh, Scott uh, mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Um, yeah, and there's something actually I failed to mention that I should have. There's a scent of incense that's being burned all through this palace that's interfering with Tarzan's scent, which is one of the reasons he was having trouble finding law. So it's kind of a nice little, no, another plot twist coming up with a reasonable excuse for why Tarzan's having trouble finding law and uh, allows him to meet the, the old white guy and, and uh, get the other plot points going as well. So another clever Incense. bit of storytelling. Incense is Tarzan's kryptonite? Yeah, apparently so, that in coffee. So <laughs> we're, we're learning as we go here. We are. Um, so chapter 14. Hey, just just <laughs> to let you guys know the last couple of minutes, I don't know if it's on my end, but you both were dropping out uh, uh, every once in a while 
Yeah, so when you play or hear that back, you might hear that okay. or, or whatever is going on. Okay. Um, hopefully that won't interfere with the recording. Well, yeah, most, most, yeah and, and most of it's coming through, but every once in a while it sort of sounds like an a, 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 and then goes back to whatever. Okay. It might be my connection, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're up to Chapter 14 here where we have a lion that, we, uh, that I think everybody realizes is, is God Balja um, entering the city uh, and hearing the roar of another lion. Um, Tarzan's spear kills the, the Bulgani, um, and, uh, kills the, the lion, right? And uh, um, some of the slaves nearby revolt at this and they kill some of the Bulgani. Uh, so the old Englishman enters and um, another slave. And so you have nine men total facing 50 angry uh, Bulgani. But then Jad Balja enters and uh, a big giant lion is a great way of evening the odds in a fight. Um, and uh, uh, Tarzan actually thinks quickly the way he always does in tactical situations. And he, play, uh, he gets Jod up on the throne um, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, dead, the dead emperor lion is thrown through the window. And um, uh, you know, now we've got a new lion emperor. We've got an ongoing slave revolt uh, that can, that's, might be strong enough to overthrow the Bagani. Uh, Tarzan tells La that he'll drive out, he'll, he'll get her back on the throne of Opar uh, with the aid of the black slaves here. So uh, he's now sure they're going to revolt. So his plan is for them to revolt against the Bogani, earn their, uh, win their freedom, and then um, uh, use their help to get uh, Law back on the throne. So he sends uh, 30 of the uh, warriors back to the various villages for reinforcements. Um, and then there's a, some negotiations when the Bogani return for revenge. He's just playing for time. Uh, but the Bogani, they're smart. Remember, they're like human intelligence, despite despite being um, a gorillas. And they've completely surrounded the, the throne room. And um, if I can find my right page of notes <laughs> to continue describing this. Uh, Oil-soaked rags. Yes. There we go. Um, you know that yes, they start they they start to throw oil-soaked rags in from trapdoors in the ceiling, which fills fills the throne room with with suffocating smoke, which gives us to yet another another great cliffhanger. Is uh, Jess, you're going to be taking over the summary, but we're going to switch back to Esteban and his group in the jungle. Um, so it's a that's an action-packed uh, chapter, and things are moving along at a very fast pace. And I think it is true that, uh, of Tarzan that when he's in a, a battle situation, a tactical situation, he can come up with a plan really quick. He's a, he's, a one, he's a strong leader and a great tactician that never stops thinking about the situation and coming up with intelligent plans for dealing with it. Uh, well said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things here, uh, one to, to note, we are using the terms gorilla and Bulgani pretty much uh, interchangeably. Bulgani, yeah. of course, is a Mangani term uh, for, for the gorilla. Uh, either way, it's, it's a large uh, ape, uh, very strong, and in this case, they speak very well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if we say Bulgani, we mean gorilla, just to, to throw that out there. And uh, there's a good Mangani dictionary from Jairo Uparella available at erbzine.com. If you can't find it, let me know and I'll help you all find it. We we're talking about it just last night. Um, this is a tangled web we have here, as is often the case in the Burroughs novel. But it's a good tangled web, a lot going on, many plot threads. So mm -hmm. to recap these open issues, and, 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 and let me know here if I've forgotten something. We have stolen gold we're keeping track of. Mm -hmm. I think we've got some stolen jewels also. Uh, Flora's status, she's just been appointed de facto leader of her little villainous troop, but, but that, that's, that's a full-time job keeping those people together. Mm -hmm. uh, Esteban Miranda's status, he's gone nuts. He thinks he's Tarzan, but he doesn't even know Mangani language uh, exists, alone learning how to speak it. 
Uh, Law's been tossed off her throne. Tarzan's uh, figuring out a way to get her back on. Uh, we've seen Jad Balja grow up, and now he's sitting on the throne over at the Valley of the Palace of Diamonds, uh, temporarily, I would hope. He may like the job. Um, and, um, and we've got some 5,000 slaves and a num number, uh, good number of uh, Bulgani there in the Valley of Palace of Diamonds who are um, uh, having, a dis having a dispute with Tarzan. And uh, that, may, that may work to Tarzan's uh, favor later on here with some of that uh, tactical effort on his part. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving in now to Chapter 15, Map of Blood. Do I, did I get all the open issues? Did I leave anything out? I think that covers it. All right. Well, we'll see if we can untangle this web here. Chapter mm -hmm. 15, Map of Blood. Uh, Esteban and Owaza, that's the headman that we were talking about earlier, decide to dig up one bar of that hidden gold to hire porters to carry the remaining gold to the coast. They're out of funds, so they're going to have to make some money. How else are you going to do it? Well, you dig up a bar of gold. Mm -hmm. Esteban makes a map of the gold's location upon his leopard skin with the blood of a rodent. He uses, who would touch a map written in blood? Uh, make a notation <laughs> of that. Make a notation. If someone hands you a map written in blood, find out where the blood came from. And also another notation, <laughs> when you're camping, always take an ink pen with you. Mm -hmm. So that's just a couple of, of uh, footnotes well, there. You, you learn all kinds of things from Burroughs novels. Go ahead. Well, in, in Pulp Adventure Stories, if a map's written in blood, it probably really does lead you to a treasure or to something that has a curse on it, one or the other. I remember that from Pirate Stories when I was a little fellow. They always, mm -hmm. uh, always was treasure involved in a map like that. But, mm -hmm. but still, the blood of a rodent, that just doesn't sound healthy. That was <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in London, uh, Jane's father is getting better, so she leaves London, heads back home to Africa there to find the Bazaari have returned, but there's no Tarzan. Well, this is a problem. There's no Tarzan. Uh, she and Korok have this big discussion, and, and he decides, when, he, when, when his mom tells him, he decides to stay at home, and she's going to go take some Wazari and go see if she can find Tarzan. So Jane leaves in search of Tarzan with 50 Wazari warriors. Esteban and Owaza do not return uh, to the uh, Hawks party. They're off on their own now. Luvini, who now serves as headman, convinces four Hawks that Esteban and Owaza <laughs> have decided to attack the Arab slavers on their own. So Flora Hawks and others head for the raiders' camp. First, they send a header runner to warn the raiders about Esteban and Waza, who are actually heading a different direction. There's a lot of confusion here mm -hmm. and misinformation. It's a wild goose chase. That's Carl Kraske's idea. He hates Esteban, and the Hawks party is floundering and making ridiculous plans according to changing circumstances, incomplete information, and subplots. It's like watching the Keystone Cops. When Flora Hawks and friends reach the Arab camp a week later, the Arabs are suspicious, having seen nothing of Esteban and Owasa. Meanwhile, and as coincidences occur in the jungle, Jane Safari sets up camp just a mile from those Arabs. Luvini plans, the new headman, plans to betray Flora Hawks and friends by killing the Arabs and abducting Flora for sale to a Sultan of North Africa, as if we didn't have enough going on. Mm -hmm. But, but Flora, Flora is warned of the plot, so she leaves the Arab camp just as the mutiny of slaves begins there. After killing the Arabs, Luvini follows them into the jungle with his band of ex-slaves. Um, and I think we get, you know, Flora is going to have a redemption story arc. Um, you know, by the end, she'll have realized the error of her ways. The fact that she can befriend a little boy uh, enough to where he likes her to to uh, warn to warn um, uh, her of the of the plot, I think, is our first hint that Flora isn't all all bad; that she still has some good in her. Well, a after after everything she just went through in that last chapter, I just summarized, and that was a summary. The details much better than I can relate it. Uh, mm -hmm. That that was all that make her think about her behavior. Yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, over in chapter 16, entitled The Diamond Horde, uh, picking up the fight that uh, we uh, left in chapter 14, under cover of smoke, bo smoke bombs, the old man from the Palace of Diamonds, and Burroughs only calls him the old man. He was the guy who was with Stanley Livingston. Uh, the old man leads Tarzan alive through an exit behind the throne that goes to the basement of the Tower of Diamonds. 
there they each take a five pound bag of diamonds. So these, this is a, I, this is on my open plot thread uh, or list, but it's just now being mentioned, a five pound bag of diamonds, and they make a break for the east gate. And just as they arrive, the reinforcements from the village, from the uh, Gomangani that is from the villages, appear and they help overcome the Bolgani. The natives want Tarzan to be their king, but he nominates the old man to be their leader. The 100 remaining Bolgani agree to act as Law's bodyguard and return to Opar to punish Kaj. So this is Tarzan doing some more of that tactical thinking on his feet. So the, the, with those Bolgani, some 100 Bolgani and 3,000 Gomangani, they move towards Opar. So Tarzan has a good sized force now. Now Manu the monkey though, uh, who's a chatterbox and is working really with, with the Oparians, warns Opar that there's this large force coming their way. Five, uh, 100 Bolgani and 3,000 Gomangani. Great battle breaks out, big battle. Kaj escapes to the sacrificial altar. This is an Opar now during the battle. Kaj escapes to the sacrificial altar where he's about to kill Tarzan, who's been knocked unconscious by the beastly priest. This happens. Fortunately, Jab al -Jah arrives like the cavalry in time to bite off the face of Kaj, so that takes care of him. Um, the fighting is, um, is resolved. Laz reestablishes queen. They have a great banquet. Tarzan and Jab al -Jah head for home. But we ain't done yet. <laughs> that concludes chapter 16. Any comments before I move on? Well, that, that kind of ends the whole Opar storyline there. So, so the, the storylines now have rejoined. Um, Good point. And let's see, to, to just summarize what we have. So the Opar story is done, but back in the jungle, Flora and her confederates, except for Esteban, are all running away from Lavina and the, his like warriors who have just killed all the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And Jane's nearby with the safari. And Esteban and Awaza are off on their own trying to get, uh, and the only ones who know where the gold is. In. So I think that covers the current situation, doesn't it? Sounds good to me. Uh, uh, speaking of um, uh, looking at the rock, but that does inspire lo looking at the roster here. Flora Hawks and her four followers are Peebles, Throck, Bluebird and Kraski, and I'm leaving out Esteban. You could call him a fifth follower if he were still following them. Mm -hmm. But Peebles, Throck, Bluebird, and Kraski. Peebles and Throck are both English fighters or boxers. Uh, Tim summarized all this for us earlier. Mm -hmm. Adolf, or maybe Scott, I guess, it was early on in the book. Uh, Adolf Bluebird is, is the German. Well, we won't discuss his weight management issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, Carl Kraski is the handsome Russian dancer. Uh, he he dislikes Esteban a great deal. So that's that's Flora's uh, Flora Hawk's uh, followers. Flora her followers are pursued by Lee Luvini and his two hundred warriors through the jungle night. They bump into Jane Safari, who is surprised to see her former employee Flora Hawks. Jane didn't know Flora was in town. Note note that. This is all seen by someone with gray eyes from a tree that overhangs the camp. Well, I get we have two choices here, and I'll give you a hint. It ain't Tarzan. <laughs> Laura tells Jane she is on a scientific expedition with Mr. Bluebird and that their safari porters have turned against them. This is Flora thinking on her feet mm -hmm. and lying through her teeth. Luvini and his warriors attack while the two women huddle by a tree for protection from the gunfire. The gray-eyed man in the tree carries off Flora, leaving Jane behind. And may I say, Jane is flabbergasted. She thinks it's Tarzan. Didn't get a look at him. It was all the confusion of battle. It was nighttime. She thinks it's Tarzan, her husband. And Jane falls sobbing to the ground. So she's all upset, and with good reason. This leaves her vulnerable. Is captured. Jane is captured by Luvini and his warriors who have circled the camp. The Wazari pursue Luvini to the Arab village but held off by a very stout stockade. Jane is tired, tied to a stake inside of the hut near the gateway. Yusilla and ten Wazari warriors pile a brush on one side of the stockade. Luvini, who thinks he has captured Flora, finds out that it is really Jane, the wife of Tarzan, and attempts to have his way with her. Yusilla and those uh, ten Wazari warriors who are piling up brush uh, 
begin to burn the palisade, which soon turns the entire village into a roaring inferno of flames. Everyone runs, but Jane cannot be found. Later, a blackened corpse is found, and the Rosari think it is Jane, so they bury her ashes. Usilla feels guilty. That, uh, not so much that he burned the place down, but that he thinks Jane mm -hmm. was caught in the fire. Yeah, and this is the second time in the last three novels that Jane was presumed to have burned to death, and they find a corpse, they, a burned corpse they think is her. So th right. that seems to happen to Jane an awful lot. You, know, you gotta rethink your life choices if that particular situation keeps coming up. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, one of those instances was in Tarzan the Untamed. We just had a discussion about mm -hmm. that in my Facebook group just last night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the other thing is, was anybody else, I might be being unfair to Jane here. I realized that she wouldn't have assumed, oh, it must be a physical twin of my husband, that she really thought it was Tarzan and the glimpse she had of him. I get that. But when he runs off with Flora, she apparently just decides, oh, he's running off with another woman. And she doesn't stop to think that, no, it's Tarzan. I know I can trust him. And whatever the explanation is, it's not that he abandoned me to run off with another woman. It's got to be something else going on. I mean, um, I mean, maybe if she'd had a few minutes to think it through before getting captured, she might have she realized that. But well, I would say I was a little bit disappointed with Jane for not trusting Tarzan a little more. Well, uh, and your point is well taken. I just want to point out there was a lot going on, a lot of confusion. There was a noise of the battle. Her own yeah. safety was very quickly at, at risk here. Yeah. Um, so uh, she um, yeah, I'm, uh, may not I'm have probably, time to think it through. Yeah, I'm probably judging her a little harshly there. But uh, it's just been established so many times that Jane and Tarzan are, are absolutely 100% faithful to each other. Um, and and But yeah, it's... That's a fair point. I'm I'm probably judging her too harshly. Yeah. But I think it's I, I think your point though is a natural question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I I was I, I just saw her as being very very upset. Uh, yeah. With some reason. I mm -hmm. um, all right. Moving forward then to chapter eighteen, the spore of revenge. Tarzan. So things are still the Opar. Tarzan heads for home with Jab Balja and his sack of diamonds. All right, make a notation of the sack of diamonds. Mm -hmm. Within a week's march from the bungalow, he discovers tracks of his Wazari and of Jane heading away from toward the south, so he follows them for six days. When he bumps into the Wazari uh, coming back, Usala tells Tarzan to kill him since they have lost Jane. After hearing the entire story, Tarzan heads out alone on the track of Luvini and revenge. He doesn't kill Usali. He's very understanding and forgiving. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, a florist group, but without Flora, this is Peebles, Throck, Bluebird, and Kresge, drag their way towards the West Coast. They are attacked by pygmies, but are saved by Tarzan. He takes them along because they would perish in the jungle without him. And that night, Tarzan drops his pouch of diamonds. Kraski picks it up, hides it in his shirt, and does not explain that he's found some diamonds. The next day, they arrive at a native village where Tarzan is welcomed, and he gives orders for the safe passage, safe passage of the four men, that being uh, Peebles, Throck, Bluver, and Kraski, to the coast. Tarzan walks away without a word of farewell. Tarzan's got other business on his mind, uh, notably that, that revenge where Jane was concerned. Now does, does, that, does that sack of diamonds remind you of the bag of jewels from uh, Jewels of Opar? You know, oh, yes. Well, I'm glad you pointed it out because I meant to because when we were talking earlier and saying that there was some, some similarities with Jules, the book Tarzan and Jewels of Opar, that is the obvious one right there. Yeah, it's a sack of jewels that that changes hands from different people, and 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 to our listeners, that's not a cut at all against Burroughs or against J Tarzan and Jewels of Opar or against this book. Uh, all these these books are favorites of mine. Burroughs mm -hmm. my favorite author, but it's just little twists that make the stories different. Mm -hmm. Because as you'll see here, we're not done yet, and 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 it still is is still very interesting and well written. Moving now into any other comments, anybody? Um, yeah, I just do want to comment that in our summaries, all of us, 
Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, we're covering this pretty quickly. I do want to just mention one more time, because most of them are about to leave the story, that everybody in Flora's group had their own personality. Um, and they, it wasn't just four, name, you know, four nameless thugs in this group with Flora. They were four individual human beings who were all rotten human beings. But uh, Burroughs does a very good job of giving them their, each their own personality and uh, their own individuality. Well said. Mm -hmm. Now moving into chapter 19, entitled The Barbed Shaft Kills. Kraski awakens, awakens early and leaves the village alone. He's afraid Tarzan will come looking for his diamonds, so he gets out of town, so to speak. So Kraski's off on his own. This is like, this is like uh, herding, herding geese they all, or herding cats. They all go different directions. <laughs> the remaining group, that would be Peebles, Throck, and Bluber, are perplexed by Kraski's absence, but they head for the coast without him. Meanwhile, Kraski is attacked by ants, tears off his clothes, and goes running naked. He comes to a hut and hears the voices of Esteban, Miranda, and Flora. Kraski makes a skirt, and he realizes he's naked. He wants to be presentable. He makes a skirt of long jungle grasses to cover his nakedness and appeals to them for help, but they tell him to move on. Kraski even tries to shoot Esteban, but Esteban throws a spear through Kraski's heart. So that takes care of him. Esteban picks up the bag of diamonds, mistaking them for ammunition. He didn't take a close look at them. Mm -hmm. Esteban has gone completely nuts because he thinks he's really Tarzan. Esteban then realizes there's diamonds in the bag and says they're all his, but he will share them with Flora if she is a good girl. That's open for interpretation. Mm -hmm. Flora hates him, but desires the great wealth that those diamonds represent. They came there to make money, after all, and so far things have gone, gone poorly for them. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Tarzan discovers his diamonds are missing, so when he meets up with the three people headed for the coast, because he goes back to ask them if anyone knows where the diamonds are, that would be Peebles, Throck, and Bluebird. He has them stripped and searched. No diamonds. So that leaves Kraski, which explains why he disappeared earlier that day. Tarzan follows Kraski's trail and finds Kraski's dead body. He, Tarzan, finally comes upon Flora and Esteban, just as Esteban is deserting her in the jungle. That's the end of chapter 19. I have to say that scene with Kraski going through the jungle and getting attacked by ants and having to tear his clothes off and the horror of being naked and the psychological effect that has to add to his his sense of panic um that that was really kind of a, a pretty horrific instance uh a right you know a situation he was in and and burroughs really hits all the right emotional notes um kraski's been a rotten rotten guy but you come pretty close to feeling sorry for him he's brought all this on himself but mm -hmm. The, the situation Burroughs puts him in is so horrific that I have to say I was feeling a little sympathy for him right for, for a few moments until he goes back to trying to commit murder. But very, very well said. I thought that was a horrific scene, meaning it was well written and in yeah. good detail. And uh, I was envisioning it on the movie screen. It would have been um, something uh, something to watch. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it does make you feel sorry. For, make you feel sorry for him despite his bad character. Mm. Chapter 20, entitled The Dead Return, the mad Esteban makes his camp and has a vision of a woman dressed in white. She says, my love, my love, and he springs toward her. Tarzan comes upon Flora Hawks, who confesses everything. He carries her to Esteban's camp just in time to see Jane approaching him. Esteban runs away, and the real Tarzan and Jane are reunited. Oh, there is Jesco, uh, Joe Jesco artwork of this very of this very encounter. Is that what he uh, used where, for the um, cover? Uh, uh, not, it's not on the cover. Mm -hmm. And I'll look up the title here before if, of the artwork. But it, it shows uh, Jane in the campfire. You got Tarzan mm -hmm. on one side and Esteban on the other side. Um, and it's nighttime, mm -hmm. and, and 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 you can see there's a there's a, a confusion there as to who is who. But it's it's artwork I think that you don't you don't see the artwork posted very often by the way but it's worth mm. looking up. I will. Uh, the, the, so so Tarzan and Jane finally talk, uh, 
and the deception of Esteban is explained. Tarzan tells Jabal Ja to go fetch Esteban. Tarzan does not want to leave Jane alone in the jungle. So Jabal Ja goes off to look for him. Jane explains how she killed Luvani with his own knife and how she escaped the fire under a wiper noose of one of the Arabs. Jabal Ja returns with a bloody leopard skin so they think he has killed Esteban after all. Now this leopard skin is not just any bloody leopard skin. That's our map, by the way. When they search for the body and the diamonds in the morning, they find that Esteban had made it to a river, but he must have been eaten by crocodiles, meaning that we have not discovered a body yet. So when you don't mm -hmm. find the body, that means that person may still be with us. Tarzan and Jane agree to take Flora back as they're made in Africa. Uh, Flora, Flora ha has, um, has uh, expressed her sorrows and regrets. They've forgiven her and they've agreed to take her ba back in their employment. The Wazari arrive against Tarzan's orders to stay behind and tell him that the gold is buried near the river. However, when they dig in the spot, they find it is gone. All they have is a leopard skin with a mystery map painted in rodent blood uh, and, and don't quite know what to do with it. Uh, that's all for chapter 20. Any comments? Um, yeah, I, I like that Burroughs uh, allowed Jane to be proactive. She does need to be rescued a lot all through the Tarzan novels, but she has courage and intelligence of her own. We see that in previous novels, uh, most especially, I think, in Tarzan the Terrible, but we see it again here. I mean, she takes out the guy who was trying to rape her uh, and has the presence of mind to put on a disguise and get away from the village uh, while a battle is going on. Um, and that's pretty awesome, though. So Jane was no, like, standard damsel in distress who couldn't, who would just scream and faint. She had guts and he, uh, she was perfectly capable of plunging a knife into uh, a man who was trying to, trying to violate her. Um, she's pretty awesome here. I, I think that's reflected too <laughs> in uh, um, Legend of Tarzan a couple years ago mm -hmm. where uh, um, the same thing when she was looking at sneaking the knife or, or Whatever. Again, she is willing to fight if she needs to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, intelligent and capable. I mean, all Burroughs' women are that way, the heroic ones. Um, but, it, you know, Jane, I think, personifies that here. Um, talking about the Jusco artwork that I, I mentioned earlier, I've looked up the title of that uh, work. This is one of the Jusco colossal cards, trading cards that appeared in the mid-1990s. This one is mm -hmm. called Spectre. S-P-E-C-T-R-E, -E, Spectre. It does so show Jane by the campfire. And we are looking over the shoulder of Esteban. And on the opposite side is Tarzan with Jad Balja. Well, you see a person standing there with lion. That's a good idea. That is the real Tarzan. Yeah. Of course, Jane doesn't really know about Esteban and all his shenanigans. <laughs> but the, uh, and, but the, uh, it, the event here occurs at night. So you got shadows and and it's a good scenery and the light of the fire and, and Jab Al Jaws looking sharp, of course. So the artwork is entitled Spectre. It is a Joe Jusco colossal card. You don't see it, um, you don't see it uh, around very much. While we oftentimes post a number of these pictures, this is not frequently used. Mm. But uh, if anybody contacts me in my Facebook group, I'll be happy for an excuse to post it. Let <laughs> me also note that uh, Tarzan and the Golden Lion uh, image has been painted many, many times by several artists, uh, J. Allen St. John, Thomas Yeats, uh, Roy Crinkle, uh, several others. Uh, Joe Jusco certainly has done uh, two fine versions of this. One is entitled On the Veil, that's, that's a close-up of Tarzan and Jad Balja. And then there is the magnanimous uh, Tarzan and the Golden Lion that shows more of the scenery of Africa. I think there's a giraffe in there. It's, it's a good sized picture. Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, one that you oftentimes see online and and I, these are all beautiful if you ever get an opportunity to take a look at them to to, to uh, get a print of them it, it's well worth it in my opinion if you like tarzan if you like joe jessica artwork and even if you don't these these are just extraordinary works and i highly, I, highly recommend them i remember that just go painting specter now because i have that card set which i will now <laughs> pretty much feel i'm obligated to get out and look at again <laughs> <laughs> It, it certainly will stir up some memories after we've been through mm -hmm. this book. And yeah. now, if I can here, I'm going to get back here to chapter 21, which I believe will wrap everything up for us. Oh, any, any further comments before I do that? No? No, I think you covered it. Okay. 
Uh, chapter 21, An Escape and a Capture. Fleeing Tarzan, Esteban loses his leopard skin in a thorn bush. Um, he floats down the river on a fallen tree and is captured by Obibi, the cannibal. The witch doctor, who ought to know about such things, we ran into the witch doctor previously, calls uh, Esteban, he th thinks this is the river devil, but Obibi, who is the chief, says it's Tarzan of the Apes. So this is an ongoing conversation two of them have had, and Obibi is glad to have captured his hated enemy. Esteban, with his bag of diamonds, is bound and thrown into a filthy hut condemned for life imprisonment in a village of cannibals. Owaza, the farmer headman, returns to 1580s and digs up the gold and heads for the coast. Owaza camps at a nearby village and the native chief tells him he may sell his gold to someone nearby and save the trouble of carrying it all the way to the coast. Owaza accepts this offer. Well, that man who is willing to buy the gold is Tarzan, whom Owaza momentarily mistakes for Esteban. The hmm. gold is carried to Tarzan's bungalow and the native bears along with Owaza are sent back to their own country and Tarzan does not pay a dime for this. Mm -hmm. But Owaza is going to jail. Tarzan believes the diamonds are lost at the bottom of the Ogogo River. Only the mad Esteban knows the truth about the diamonds, and he remains in the clutches of Obibi, the cannibal. And Esteban's fate is addressed in Tarzan and the Ant-Man. And, yeah. uh, and those jewels, also diamonds, rather, is also uh, discussed there. Mm. All right, end of story. Yeah, and, and I know that the, that he does return to Esteban in the next novel to just finalize his fate, but dramatically for this story, um, the, the, the Esteban ending up as a prisoner apparently forever uh, is, is dramatically appropriate. It's, it's a great ending, I think more satisfying than just having him get eaten by crocodiles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it is interesting. I like that Tarzan's not completely infallible. You know, for all his jungle craft, he makes an in he makes a incorrect inference when he thinks that Esteban was eaten by crocodiles. Um, so even Tarzan can can make a mistake from time to time. But uh, this really was a wonderful novel. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning, when I read it as a twelve year old, when I was first reading through the Tarzan novels, I was loving these novels, and I still remember thinking that this one was just okay. I don't know why now. But um, it really is just another wonderful adventure story, a great mm -hmm. example of world building with the Balgani and the, uh, the Palace of Diamonds and uh, wonderful supporting characters. Very well said. Multiple plot threads that Burroughs weaves it all together. Mm -hmm. a master craftsman. Yeah. Yeah, he um, does. He has a lot of different episodes. You know, these, these books of the TV series each of these chapters could almost be a half hour, hour episode across a TV year or season. Yeah, it would, it would make a neat, a neat mini series, I think. So with, uh, that would give you time to develop the personalities of the different characters and, yeah. uh, and tell the story well. I agree. So, okay, um, any other comments on the novels before, on the novel before we wrap it up? Nothing Anything? else from me. Yeah, I think we did it's a pretty been a pleasure. Good... I'll say that I've enjoyed it a great deal. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's a fun one, yeah. Okay, uh, next time we were talking about doing um, uh, The Battle of Pellucidor, one of the new ERB Universe novels. Um, you guys still okay with that for our next, our next podcast? I'm yeah. fine with it. Okay, so, um, so we'll be talking about, uh, anybody listening who doesn't know, uh, Agar Rice Bros Incorporated is doing a series of authorized novels as well as comic books that are considered canon with the uh, with the first with the twenty with the uh, 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 other no with the the novels actually written by Burroughs, not just the Tarzan novels, but Mars, Venus, uh, Pellucidor, and his other um, um, other settings. And so, Battle for Pellucidor has Tarzan. Going back to Pellucidor, I have to confess that I bought it, but I haven't read it yet. So I will, obviously, before our next podcast. But it has a World War II setting, doesn't it, Jess? 
Yes, it does. There's Nazis in Pellucidor, and what are we going to do about it? Okay, and Nazis in Pellucidor is just, you want me to spend money on a book? Just say Nazis in Pellucidor. <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll give you a hint. As a further inducement, there are Mayhars involved, too. Okay. Not surprising, but yeah, the, that's that's awesome, too. So, um, so I guess that is it for tonight. Um, once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Um, you can find uh, my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff. A link to my Amazon.com author page there. If anybody listening wants to go there and buy my books and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice, I have no objections to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, do you guys want to plug anything uh, while saying goodbye? Well, I will put in a, a plug for my Facebook discussion group with Lilla Pop, and that would be for the love of all things Edgar Rice Bros. You'll find this on Facebook. You're welcome to come and talk uh, all things ERB with us. And, and, and let me also add that I've been broadcasting via Gridley Way from our studios in Pellucidor, and <laughs> some of the local Mayhars have invited me over for Christmas dinner, which I'm a little hesitant to accept. In case I don't make it to the next podcast, well, you'll probably figure out what happened where Mayhars are concerned. <laughs> <laughs> you may be the main course there, Jeff, so I would I, I could, I about could, that. I could, I, the, the, there is that possibility, so, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. That's all from me. Uh, I'll just say uh, the products, the uh, books and stuff that are coming out from ERB Incorporated, mm -hmm. uh, audience, go out and support them so they can keep on, you know, making new ones and seeing that there's a good, strong audience out there. Mm -hmm. I recommend Tim's books, too. They're well worth the read. They're well worth you buying. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that's and, it for and now. It's Excuse me, I've, I've been enjoying your mini podcast on the Tarzan and the Apes, by the way. I, I oh, well, really thank recommend you. those. It was, a, it, was, it was a great job there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and that's it for now. If there are those of you listening, if you're enjoying the podcast, we would appreciate it if you could take a few moments to leave us an iTunes review, which I understand does help us attract more listeners. And uh, we'll be back again soon with another podcast episode. Uh, and in the meantime, I will continue to be doing the uh, the mini podcast where I'm doing a chapter by chapter analysis of Tarzan of the Apes. And we will see you all again soon. <laughs>